Alrighty. Hi everyone and welcome to Australian Property Expert Tips for Expats and Overseas Buyers. I'm America Josh and it is my pleasure to be hosting tonight's discussion. We've posed the question broadly with interest rates holding steady for now, what opportunities exist in today's property market for home buyers and investors? So what we've done is we've gotten two experts in this field to talk about the implications and all of the planning that goes into this. Ben Wong is the co-founder and principal mortgage broker at Odin Mortgage and Rich Harvey, CEO of Property Buyer. Property Buyer. Hello to you both. G'day, thanks for having us, Josh. Not a problem at all. So I wanted to head off and sort of set up how we're going to be doing uh, this webinar this evening. So one thing I did want to touch on early is that we won't be going into a lot of depth about tax in this webinar. Now, tax plays a, a huge role in your decision about buying a home and managing property in Australia from overseas. And it's incredibly important. We are definitely not minimizing that. And we've had a lot of questions around taxation and, and the ongoing obligations of someone who's investing. Uh, your individual situations, your positions, your history, everything that goes into who you are, are all too unique to give proper tax advice. So we, we will give, we will certainly be touching on the issues and talking about when you need to really think about the tax implications, but it's important that you get individual advice and get a tax professional to separately go through your individual situation. That being said too, we do have a disclaimer, as always, this webinar is intended to provide a basic understanding of how mortgages, home buying and management work between Australia and Australians abroad. And some of these answers may not apply to you. So if you want to be sure about your specific situation, just like the tax, be sure to contact uh, Ben and Rich after this webinar and we'll make sure to share their details. So you'll have uh, no shortage of information coming at you after this webinar, but seek individual professional advice. So. That all being said, thanks for coming tonight. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we do have the option to add questions through the Q&A functionality that you'll find at the bottom of the screen. So I'll be keeping an eye on that. If you do have some questions that you want to raise, please do raise them and we will get to them as we go along. Rich and Ben have prepared some presentations. So we're going to start with those. And as we go along, if there are ways that for me to get some questions in there that when you put your uh, questions in the Q&A section, I can make sure we, uh, we jump to those. So. Thank you both very much again. Ben, I'm going to jump right into you because I know you're a wealth of knowledge when it comes to mortgages uh, with your background at Odin Mortgage. So th thanks for joining us. Do you want to start by telling us a little bit about yourself and, uh, and Odin Mortgage? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the uh, Australian Property Webinar. Um, so I'm the head mortgage broker and co-founder of Odin Mortgage. Been doing this for a decade now, uh, specifically in just expat mortgage broking for people living overseas. So I was based in Hong Kong uh, for the majority of that, but we had an office in Singapore as well. So we were servicing mainly Hong Kong, Singapore, and the Middle East. Um, that's predominantly 60% of our market base, and the other 40% is from UK and the US. Those are the five main countries where Aussie expats reside. So we've just been doing that day in, day out, just foreign income applications for Aussies, and also for those with permanent residency visas, but have not yet moved to Australia. And then the other 20% of our clients are uh, foreign buyers, just um, foreign, you know, foreign nationals uh, that are not Australian citizens looking to buy investment properties in Australia. Last year, we launched our tax arm as well, Odin Tax, assisting Aussies with their property tax returns from overseas and understanding the tax implications of that. So I'm not the head, you know, the accountant myself, but working alongside our tax team, I do have quite um quite a fair bit of general knowledge that I can touch on later on, but won't go too deeply into. <laughs> yeah. So I think I'll just get started, right, Josh? I'll, I'll yeah, go. go for it, man. Okay. So I'm going to start off with the Australian lending overview. You know, what's still possible for um, DLZs living in, in, in the US? You'll notice that we can still go up to 80% loan to value ratio. So this is very standard in Australia. Everyone be able to go up to 80%. And then you can always go up over 80%, but with something called lender's mortgage insurance, which is a fee that you need to pay with to the banks. So unlike in, Austra uh, in Australia, where you have 40, 50 different banking options, when you're in the US, that probably shrinks down to around 10 banks. Okay, Just the vast majority of banks will not lend to expats living in, in the US and only one bank being CBA will lend you up to 90% with lenders mortgage insurance. 
You can still leverage your existing Australian properties. All right. If you're lucky enough to have one or two existing Australian properties, you can tap into those properties and um, go back up to 80% and take any equity cash out to help you buy your next property. I'll share a slide on that later. Uh, you can do 30 year loan term regardless of age. So you could be, you know, like a, a 80 year old. Um, and if you can still show strong cash flows, those will give you 30 years uh, loan term. Although there is one bank now that has introduced retirement age policy up to 67 to determine your loan term. So if you're 57, that's 10 years away from retirement. So they're only going to give you 10 year loan term. But there's only one bank at the moment. That's Heritage, Heritage Bank. Um, there's no early repayment penalties in Australia by law. Okay. Um, so I don't know what's it like in the US, but in Singapore and Hong Kong, if you get a mortgage um, on a property locally, they have a 2-3% early repayment penalty in the first two years. Um, and sometimes it goes up to the third year. But in Australia, there's none of that. There's just a nominal discharge fee of around $300, um, $350. That's why it's quite easy to jump from bank A to bank B, uh, refinancing. And so the banks, all the banks in Australia are forced to be quite competitive. you notice um, the interest rates among each other is just within 0 0.1 to 0.2% of each other. Fees are very nominal. So we're coming to the latter end of 2023 now. So I want to touch on what's been happening this year. As you know, interest rates have been going up month on month for, you know, um, pretty much 11 months straight. And, and that does affect the assessment rate. So what I mean by that is um, what the, what was the interest rate that the banks use to assess your borrowing capacity? So even if we're going to get you a, a loan of 6%, that the banks use something up to nine and a half percent, all right, to, uh, to calculate how much you can borrow. They do that just to be safe um, in case there's an, another 3% of increases. Um, but they've been adding this 3% buffer all the way along. So obviously right now, the probability of going up another 3% is very, very, well, it's, 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 I'm going to say it's not, it's not going to happen. All right. Um, mo most people think it has peaked or close to peaking, but they still use nine and a half percent. Okay. So you just got to bear that in mind. It's quite conservative there. The, obviously the rates have increased. Like I touched on is now flat for the last four months. The RBA has kept the rates on hold for the last four months. Um, and I want to talk about the implications of that. Um, fixed rates are still, slightly higher than the variable rate. So the vast majority of our clients, I would say 90% of our clients or 95% of our clients in the last six months have all been opting for variable rates um, instead of fixed rates. And in terms of, and uh, speaking of fixed rates, there's this term called fixed rate cliff. You're just talking about all of the people who fixed their interest rates in 2020 and 2021 at super low rates at 2%, they're coming to an end soon. And we're about halfway through that. A lot of them have now reverted back to variable. Talk about that a little bit as well uh, later on. And lastly, um, I would say the trend for lender options have started to get more restricted, slightly more restricted, okay? So these, like uh, I put six banks here, you know, they made some changes that were not in favor of expats this year. So Bank Australia, Virgin, Money, they stopped lending to experts. Uh, they said temporarily, don't know how long. Kudos, they exited the market a year ago. They haven't come back on. Heritage Bank, they went from 80% LVR to 70%. And then Bankwest, they went from 80% to 60% LVR two months ago. And St. George Bank, um, this one doesn't really apply to uh, those in America too much. But they force us to use Australian income tax rates to assess Singapore, Hong Kong, and UAE income. It hurts because those countries have very low income tax. So when you're forced to use 45% marginal income tax, it obviously, um, you know, it hurts the, the borrowing power. Now for investor housing rates, I just want to show you what, um, you know, what, what the rates are that people in Australia are paying at the moment. So this, this graph here shows the average interest rates that homeowners in Australia for investment lending are paying for at the moment. So this red line here is the variable rate. Okay. So you can see that variable rates were higher than fixed rates in 2020, 21. So that's why a ton of people fixed their interest rates. All right. In these last two, in, in these two years, but that has changed like in, at the start of 2022, where fixed rates are now uh, uh, much higher than, than variable. So you can kind of see um, this, this is a proxy um, for, for rates to come. 
uh, in the future because the banks were pricing fixed rates higher than variable rates. So they predicted that rates were going to, you know, um, start going up from the Reserve Bank of Australia. So you can see now it's kind of like merging now, you know, um, to, together. So we're, we're pretty much now at this point where, where, where rates have peaked, maybe slightly one more, and I'll show you like a prediction um, in the next slide. So the average um, investor right now is paying 6.28%, okay? So if you're at 6.28% or higher, six and a half, seven percent someone at 8%, definitely can't chat, chat to us. We'll be able to get you investment variable rates from 6.04%. <laughs> All right, um, and and fixed investment fixed rates from six point one nine percent. Now talking about the fixed rate cliff, I'll go over this one quickly. There are so yeah, 2020, 2021, 400 billion dollars of fixed rates were you know uh, were issued, and there's two. Um, and this is what I was talking about where we're halfway done. All right, so a lot of them have come off already and and, and expired. So when I say expired, right, what what it just means is, um. It just reverts back to the variable rate, you know. But a lot of people, when they get reverted back to the variable rate, it's it's not it's not heavily discounted by the bank. The bank just gave you the standard discount. So a lot of people were on around seven percent when they came off, you know, or high sixes, six point five to you know six point nine around there, and we're about halfway done. Okay, so the rest will come, um, you know, um, in in early early twenty twenty four. So there's two school of thoughts, I think, um, with the fixed rate cliff ending. You know, some of the doomsayers were saying that um, it's going to cause a lot of financial stress and people coming off fixed rates, their repayments will go up by 50 to 100 percent from 2 percent to, you know, 6, 7 percent. It is around like 50 to 100 percent increment in your monthly repayments and and the negative um, implications of that, right, uh, in, in the financial stress where they'll maybe forced to sell their properties. And so they're waiting for that to see you know, the negative impacts of that. And then maybe that kind of crashes the property prices. So, so that's one, one school of thought. And then the other one is, um, well, people can see fixed rates coming to an end. They can see, you know, it's going to be six, 7% soon. And they have a lot of lead time up to that point. So they can make a smooth, easy transition. Um, so those are the two. And, you know, the answer is always just going to be somewhere in the middle. All right. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the property. Come on, Ben, crash. pick a side. <laughs> <laughs> so, I want to just give the facts, you know, show you that. And then, you know, I think a lot of Aussies that they're, they're pretty smart, you know, uh, financially, they, they'll see things coming, adjust their budget. They've saved, a, they saved a lot during the pandemic and sure, they may have enough buffer, I would say, where the repayment started to eat into their savings. And then they think, hmm, hold on a minute, my savings are going down. They'll make some adjustments, things like that. Okay. When do we think, just on that mortgage cliff, Ben, when yeah. do we think there'd be a more, like, when do you think we could start to really see what was going to be the outcome? Is it, like you were saying, we're sort of halfway done. Is it in the next few months or is it sort of further out that we'd be able to really see it? Yeah, there's always going to be a lag, right? You think, because like if everyone has built up a, um, you know, a, a nest egg of savings. Yes. You're not going to see it's that. Not going to hit. Yeah. yeah, it's going to chip away at the savings for, for a while, right? And I think people are just going to make adjustments to the, to their budget so look with the financial stress indicator it has gone up a tiny bit right so i mean there are effects on that but uh definitely people will will make adjustments as well and the, and the central bank of australia rba in in this next slide here um i'm sure they're well aware of that all right so they don't want to hurt the lower middle class which are the ones that are getting impacted by this okay so which i feel like you know that's kind of the reason why they've also flatlined the, the rates for the last four months and probably going to go flat for the rest of this year. We'll see. So, okay. So they're saying, yeah, the high rates. Um, so yeah, we have some two extremes here, really. 20, October, 2021, all time low cash rate, 0.1%. That's pretty much the lowest has ever been ever um, in the history of Australia. And then this, this, this spike up here from 0.1% to 4.1%, that 4% increment, that, that was the fastest increment in, in any given period. Um, Again, so we went from two extremes. So the higher rates have been working as intended. So the RBA says um, in suppressing the inflation rate and, and having a downward effect on that. So with this whole uh, fiscal policy, it's, it's just all about controlling inflation. I would say that's 80% of it for, uh, for, the, for the RBA. Um, and they do predict that the inflation will come down to around 3% by mid 2025, which is you know their target here. Um, if inflation does not go down, 
um, you know, obviously then they're going to increase rates again. I just want to show you quickly the inflation rates here. Um, so at the start of 2023, we're at 7.5%. It peaked at around 8 point something um, at the latter end of 2022. And it's come down to 5%. So pretty much if it goes back up, then, you know, possibly another rate increase. But if it continues to go down or, or stay at this level, then we're going to just see rates being flat. Okay. So in terms of prediction, like, you know, clients ask, like, you know, how rates going to go up, down, uh, sideways. <laughs> I I don't I don't know like I, for for me I'll just say it's gonna go flat all right but um I, I also look at the market what the market is predicting so this is the thirty day interbank cash rate target so people can punt this right on the ASX um and it's just showing here the last I just grabbed like the last several days you know up into the 9th of October ninety five percent chance no change okay uh, there's a five percent chance that it might go up to four point three five uh three five so probably for the next month, it's going to be flat. So trying to predict what rates are going to be six months out, one year out, two year out, I, th I, th I think that's just, it's, 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 it's anyone's guess. But uh, over the next month, I think, you know, uh, this one is it's, it's fairly accurate. Again, I think the RBA is going to think about what how is this going to impact the majority of, of, of Australian homeowners. And I, and I don't think that they want to keep increasing it. Again, 50 to 100% increment in your monthly repayments is quite significant. I think they're going to let that rate cliff kind of like come off and see how people adjust to that um, and, and go from there. So probably going to go flat for the rest of this year, in my thinking. So um, I want to come back to what the banks look at for expats specifically when they're thinking about lending you money. So there's many, many variables, okay? And then, um, but I, I want to boil it down to two, just two main factors to keep things simple for our listeners here. And it, it really is just your deposit, right? How much funds you have and your income, all right? Uh, specifically in net income after expenses. So talk about deposit first, right? That's the easy thing to look at. It's it's your cash savings. It's, your, it's pretty much your liquid assets, cash, shares, a gift from your from your parents or relatives. And we can also look at equity from your existing properties, which I touched on earlier, and I'll talk about in the next slide. So this example here, right? You're buying a one million dollar property. You can borrow up to eighty percent, so that's eight hundred thousand. Then you gotta you gotta add on the stamp duty, so it's roughly around five percent by scaling. You know, it goes from like four to six, but most most around five percent. So for this pu purchase, you're gonna need two hundred fifty thousand dollars. The bank just wants to see that you have, you know, uh, that amount in in all of uh, these kind of evidence that you can provide and your cash savings and so forth. So that's fairly straightforward. Um, now, for equity cash out, this example here, let's say you bought a property five years ago uh, at 80%, you know, you borrowed $480,000 for a 600,000 purchase. Five years later in 2023, it's now worth 8,000. You know, it's gone up 5% year on year for five years straight. So, and you pay down the mortgage to 400,000. So the loan to value ratio is now 50%. But we can actually tap some equity into that, you know, back up to 80%. We can cash out. So we can take up another 240000 at this point as a, as a loan, obviously, uh, back up to 80%. And you can use that 240000 against that, you know, example I just gave you in the, in the previous slide. So in this, in this instance, you would only come up with $10,000 of your own cash. And this is a common strategy already that I think a, a lot of property um, investors already know about. They just keep rolling over. Uh, into the next purchase without having to put down uh, much of a cash outlay, and it, and it, it works amazingly in in a bull market, uh, but but less good in a, in a bear market, obviously, because um, yeah, leverage is just. And if more... someone's, yep. someone's interested in sort of taking advantage of things like this and, and optimizing the strategies, they is the best thing for them just to come like early to you and sort of present like here's the full package, here's everything I've got like tell me what the best way forward is early on or is that something that people prepare in advance of coming to you? Yeah, so this is something that they don't even uh, need to necessarily tell me about. So later, like I would tell you about this, okay? So um, we have our online form. Uh, it takes like less than five minutes to complete, but really just ask for just the questions that I need to know in order to give you the, the most uh, detailed strategic assessment of your situation of the things that you can do. So like how much you can borrow, um, what are your lender options and also the strategies like this. I do ask for like your existing Australian properties and um, you know, the the equity position in there. Cause I'll just ask like, what is your loan amount and what, what do you think it's worth? That's it. 
Um, and then I'll be able to know whether you have equity in that and whether you have, well, whether you have borrowing capacity, first of all, and whether you have equity in that, and then uh, whether you want to even think about using it. That will always be an option that I'll throw out there for you. Um, and a lot of our clients do take it, even though, let's say if you had $500,000 cash into in your bank account right now, and you didn't need to use five, you didn't even need to use equity. A lot of our clients still choose to use equity in their property just for optionality. Okay. They, they just love optionality. Um, you know, because all of that money that the bank gives you can just be deposited back into your, into your offset account, uh, your mortgage offset account. So it doesn't cost you any interest. So just think of it as just like a big credit card that you can use at a later stage. And if you're not <laughs> using any money, you know, um, it doesn't cost you anything, but instead of a credit card's 20 to 40% interest rate, you know, the, the home loan now is like, you know, six, 5%, you know, back, back then it was only 2%, right? So you definitely take it. Um, for future investment opportunities. Like I think you guys in America have so many opportunities for for investments. So it's always nice to have um, money there at any any point in time. This, yeah. So the second thing here is income. Um, all right. So this is the thing that trips out a lot of people. Uh, it's the more major thing. Um, so as I was saying before, 40 over lenders, vast majority won't lend to you if you're overseas. So the ones that do, some of them are, are harsh some of them are lenient so i kind of want to give you guys like uh the look at the the two okay so the standard one will discount us dollar income by 20 percent straight off the bat and they do that um because of the fluctuation against the australian dollar pair and i can't recall what year it was but you know the australian dollar was at parity with the us dollar right one to one at one point and now it's at um you know 60 cents so I think amazing value for you guys in, in the US right now, it's uh, uh, ranging on the lower end of things. Um, your dollar can go you know, way further now. So, okay. So anyway, that's why they discounted by 20%. Even though it's in your favor at the moment, <laughs> they're like, hey, you might go back up to parity. So I'm, I'm gonna have to put 20% here. <laughs> um, and then they'll apply the uh, Aussie tax rates or your US tax rates, wh whichever is higher. Um, uh, and then, you know, I, I put in three and a half thousand rent here. So I don't know. I, I hear that um, the rent in New York can be pretty hefty. So <laughs> be a nice place to get. Yeah, if you uh, got, found something good for three and a half. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so maybe a bit, uh, bit, bit too harsh there. Um, and then living expenses. The the banks in Australia have a uh, benchmark living expense that we have to apply. So they'll they'll take like, hey, how much this guy earns? Um, and then, um, and then they'll say, Hey, it's, it's, it's going to be around this much. Okay. And, and by doing this, we're going to be left with one and a half thousand us dollar per month. Okay. Once I discount all of this stuff and that equates to $300,000 in, in borrowing power, which is not that much. Okay. So a lot of people are quite shocked at how much they can borrow sometimes, uh, when, when living overseas. And, um, uh, but I just got to explain to them, the banks are always very conservative. All right. They're going to discount the higher tax rate. So maybe you're in Texas, you're in Texas and it's just zero percent um state tax, but you know, we're gonna have to use the higher Australian income tax at that point. And then you got the more lenient ones that they don't discount US dollar at all. Okay. They don't discount US dollar. Maybe they'll let you use the US tax rate. I'm still gonna use 30% anyway. Um, um, and then yeah, throw in the rent and the living expense the same. You know, you'll be able to borrow seven hundred thousand. Okay, so like a two X difference. So unlike in Australia, right? In Australia, all the banks are going to treat you the same because you're earning Australian dollar income. You're getting taxed at Australian income tax rates. Everyone gets treated the same. Going from bank A to bank B to bank C, I think your borrowing power is just like less than 5% variance from, from these banks. But when it comes to foreign income, it, it can actually range up to 5X or 4X. I would say 5X, okay? Um, especially for our, our expats in the Middle East where income tax is 0%. So you just imagine they're getting 0% income tax, but I'm still having to put up to 45% marginal income tax on their income is, is a huge variance um, um, in how much they can borrow. So for you guys in the US, it's actually not that bad um, in terms of the variance, but um, it's up to myself, I guess, as the expert to advise you which lenders um, is suitable for you. Because most of you guys are fairly high income earners. So, you know, I take you to the harsh lenders anyway, and, and you guys will still be fine. Um, you know, so I just want to touch on um, our value proposition here. So it really comes down to the, our wealth of knowledge. Um, having just doing foreign income applications specifically for the last decade, it really helps a lot. 
the brokers and bankers in Australia, 95%, the vast majority of their loan applications are Australian income applications. When it comes to their desk, their foreign income application, it, it, it automatically goes into the hard basket, right? They don't want to do it um, because it, it changes from country to country. And even when you submit an application through them, even through the bank directly, you might not even be getting that that 700,000 that I was talking about here. Even if you go through a linear bank, it's how you package the application. You know, how are you going to present it? Um, are you using Aussie or US tax rates? Are you, you got to make it so easy for the assessor, you know, you got to do the calculations <laughs> on their behalf um, and 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 um, pretty much write up all the summary and notes for them. So our approval rating is very high relative okay, to, to, to the standard. Um, we try to make our entire uh, platform online, especially to cater for the expats living all across the world. And um, we have a tax arm, like I was saying, um, last year. So there are some tax implications. People are always thinking like, you know, what's that CGT implications? Should I buy in my name or my wife's name or jo jointly? My wife is not an Australian citizen. She's a PR or she's a foreign national. What should I do here? So I'll be able to structure your loan application, you know, for, um, you know, for uh, opt optimal financially for, for you. So, you know, not about now in terms of now cash flow, but also later, right? With the CGT event, uh, the banks pay us. So we don't charge our clients. We don't charge you guys. Uh, Fee-free service. And all the banks pay the same. So it's just about taking you to which bank is going to be the best for you. But we'll be able to tell you exactly already. As I'm talking to you, you know, we'll start off with the 10 banks and it'll go down to like the four or three. Maybe by the time I'm done chatting with you, it's, it's just going to be very clear. It's just two banks. And then, uh, you know, you can decide between the two. I'll tell you about the pros and cons against each one. Uh, and we have um, uh, created our client concierge team six months ago. So these guys look after you after you're done with us. So once you settle the loan with us, we're going to keep pricing your loan every six months for the life of your loan. We're just calling the banks saying, hey, can you get us anything cheaper? So the banks definitely don't do this. And, and the brokers, they don't have capacity, I would say. They may say they'll do it and they may do it maybe once or, or uh, uh, um, you know, every two years, but we'll be doing it every six months uh, for you. Uh, so to ensure that you're always on the best rate or you're being looked after and giving you property reports uh, on your property, just, you know, it's by the automated valuation. So you can just keep track on, you know, how much your property is still worth, whether you want to tap out any equity from that. And then last but not least, we have uh, now formed a pretty um, solid network of, specialist partners um, covering legal conveyancing uh, fx and and property so like rich himself who, who's going to be presenting next uh buyers agencies because you know trying to source a property from overseas i think is very difficult um very difficult because you're not on the ground are you going to fly down to australia to see it it's it's, it's, it's a bit of a headache <laughs> so yeah i think buyers agencies great value um and but i'll let rich talk talk more at that that's my last, yeah, last slide. Let's take over there. Yeah. No, I love it. Thank you, Ben. I, I think that's like good to a good way to start because if we have an idea of what, you know, the the role of well, your role in the, the whole process is and understanding, you know, what the market's looking like. Now, Rich, uh, CEO of Property Buyer. So Property Buyer, you are a buyer's agency. Uh, and like I guess to start, do you want to cover what you do? And then I know you've got a, a great presentation about you know the current market and different locations around Australia. Because I know a lot of the questions that we got uh, were around you know, okay, this is all great, but uh, when you know, as Ben was touching on, it's always like when are the rates going to be best and where exactly should I be investing? So, Rich Harvey, thank you very much for taking the time, and uh, I'll throw it over to you. No worries. Just confirm that screens that the slides are up there. Yes, Josh, we can. Like yep. Yeah, perfect. No worries. Well, thank you very much, Josh. And again, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening, your time or this morning, my time. I've been out <laughs> on the golf course this morning and my claim to fame this morning, I actually got an eagle. I, I chipped the ball in. It was oh. amazing. <laughs> wow, that is a great start to a day. That is absolutely yeah, great start to a day. <laughs> um, so, just a quick bit of background on myself. Um, I've been in business for 22 years as a buyer's agent or buyer's advocate. So a buyer's advocate is someone that works purely on the buyer side, helping you to find the right property, to appraise the value, do the research, uh, do the negotiations and give you guidance along every step of the process. Um, I've been the president of the uh, Real Estate Buyers Agent Association of Australia, did that for four years. I was also the chairman of the buyer's agent chapter for 10 years. So I volunteered a lot of my time to improve standards and ethics in the industry. Um, and I was one of the original buyer's agents in Australia. So um 
now there's a lot of competition, a lot of uh, young whippersnappers coming up, but um, <laughs> we certainly have uh, a lot of experience on our Keeps side. Keeps the market exciting. <laughs> it does, it does. So I'm going to rip through my presentation, Josh, today. Um, I've got a lot of really great content, and I we do have a copy of these slides, so don't panic. You will be getting a copy afterwards. I've got some really great info and love your questions as well. So this is what we'll be doing, uh, but let's get straight into it, shall we? Um, let's just have a look at where the market's up to right now. We're in the middle of the spring season at the moment, um, and as uh, Ben's alluded to, uh, the market is a bit volatile. So consumer sentiment, this is the, Melbourne, the Westpac Melbourne Institute, that takes a bit of a pulse on how consumers are feeling about their hip pockets. And you can see here, since interest rates went up um, since about last year, it's really taken a dive and sitting around this 80 basis point. So it's pretty pretty low. People are feeling a bit gloomy about uh, the cost of living. Um, the word cost of living, I believe, has replaced COVID as the most overused word in our vernacular <laughs> at the moment. Um, auction clearance rates in most capital cities, or Sydney, Melbourne, have been hovering around early 70%, about 70 to 72. Last weekend, uh, the week two weeks ago, we had the grand finals for the AFL, NRL. So the volumes were down, but this weekend they bounced back. And yeah, pretty reasonably healthy volumes. Um, so it's still slightly in favour of the seller um, rather than the buyer. If we see it tip into the below 65%, you'll start to see the market sort of pull back a bit. But um, yeah, pretty, pretty healthy auction clearance rates. Um, let's talk about price changes. This is the most important thing to look at. Now, we're, like any any good economist, I'm actually an economist in my past. And, um, you know, the joke about economists is they know the price of everything and the value of nothing, or they read the menu from right to left. But um, jokes aside, <laughs> um, we've got to look at data within a time frame context. If we look at just the last three months, you can see here that Perth, Adelaide, Brisbane, Melbourne and Sydney have all had pretty decent increases. I mean, look at Brisbane, 4.2%, Sydney, 3.8%, Adelaide, 3.4%. Now, they're pretty you know, dramatic increases over a three-month period. Um, but if we look at it over a 12-month period, you'll see here it's just kind of breaking even where, you know, where Sydney is now reaching a peak slightly above what it was 12 months ago. And we had, you know, during COVID, um, for example, I live on the northern beaches of Sydney. In the northern beaches, prices went up 38.5% in an 18-month period. Unbelievable. I've never seen the market jump so much. And then when we saw the market slow down and correct, it probably came back about 15 maybe 20%. So it's still up 18% on what it was. Um, and I think in the next 12 months, we are going to see new record highs, even though we have higher interest rates. And I'll explain why in a minute. So pricing is very different in every area. And again, these numbers hide a lot of averages. So you've got to be very careful. Everyone asks me, Rich, how is the market? And I'm saying, <laughs> which market? Are we talking, you know, um, Camberwell in, in Victoria? Are we talking Palm Beach in Sydney? Or are we talking Wong in Brisbane, right? They're all very different markets. So you've got to understand localised factors. Um, I'll just skip that one. The other big factor in our market is sales volumes are quite low, um, a lot lower than they used to be. So you can see here the turnover is down 21% in Melbourne. It's down 16% in Sydney uh, and down 19% there. So if you guys just want to mute your background there to stop that siren, if that's all right. Yep, thank you. Um, so that's really impacted the turnover in the market, um, which is quite significant. So I've got two slides here about listing volumes. This is new listings. And you can see that we expect during spring to see a bit of a bounce. You typically see there late October, November, it really spikes. We are heading toward that, but this spring has been a lot more muted. Um, I would have expected to see a lot more listings come on the market. It's probably increased about 10%. And if we look at the next slide, which is total listings, that's the volume of all listings. Um, it's actually still down 23% compared to the five-year average. So that tells me that people are holding on to their properties longer. I think investors aren't trading their properties nearly as much as they used to, or people just aren't selling because they can't find the right thing to buy. Um, so there's a number of effects. So that limitation on the market, people are worried because of migration. They're going, well, if I sell, I'm not sure I can find the right thing. So I'll just stay where I am. And we're seeing a lot of that staying in place happening at the moment. Now, rents, uh, well, as we said, not as high as New York, but our rental market is really rocketing ahead. You know, significant increases. Perth up 13%, Melbourne 13 Sydney almost 12%. And we do have a rental crisis in, in this country. We're not building enough investment properties. 
to keep track of where we need to be in this country, unfortunately. So it is uh, it is a real real social problem and it's going to get worse. So great news if you're an investor, um, pretty tough news if you're a renter. So what's the outlook for the rest of the year and, and heading, well, that should be 2023, not 33 is a typo. Yeah, getting a little ahead of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so new listings are slowly building up. As Ben alluded to, borrowing capacity is down around 30 to 35%. That's really hampering because of that uh, preservability ratio. Um, we're in recovery mode. Um, we are still seeing really strong underlying demand and that we can't you know, rule that out. So Australia's got a structural problem with supply and demand. We don't have enough supply and it's not coming on quick enough. And I'll talk about migration in a minute. So I think that's in my coming up in my next slide. Let's have a look. Oh, no, here we go. Um, like all good economists, this is the Westpac banks forecast. I thought you'd like this one, Ben. Um, Westpac, you know, and they're often pretty conservative, right? Um, but it's all positive. They're saying strong increases this calendar year pretty strong increases next year and it heading even more positive increases going ahead. I actually think these are probably an underestimate of what's going to happen. Um, one of my favourite and most accurate forecasters is a guy called Louis Christopher from SQM Research. Um, he's proven to be one of the most knowledgeable in my view and his numbers are, he doesn't go quite out two years in advance, but his 24-month uh, forecasts are a bit stronger than that. So let's talk about migration. What we saw during um, COVID was obviously a complete shut off of borders. Now we've had a massive rebound. We are probably going to end up in Australia with somewhere between 450 to 500,000 migrants this, this current year. So that's just phenomenal number. Like it's more than the government predicted. Next year, we're expecting 350,000 and the year after probably another 300,000. So that's a million people in, in three year period. Now, we only build around about 150,000 dwellings a year in Australia. So what's going to happen? It's economics 101, right? You know, the price of real estate has to go up. We're desperately short of rental properties. Now, the Albanese, the federal government, has announced, you know, a $1.2 million target of uh, 1.2 million homes, 1.2 million homes in the next five years. Um, but I don't believe we're going to hit that kind of target. We, we just don't have the infrastructure nor the resources, nor the right incentives for the average mum and dad investor, nor institutional investors to really get going. Um, yes, there's BTR, build to rent, but that's only going to be you know a 5% proportion of the market. So um, big numbers coming. And as I mentioned, you know, over this guy Matusik has analyzed that over the next decade, the 20 period 24 to uh 2033, he reckons there'll be about 300,000 migrants. So it's another you know, 50,000 more than we've had in the past decade going forward. So very, very strong migration trend. So that's got big implications on where do we place all the people? You know, we're currently at 26 million. Um, I think we're going to be in becoming a, a bigger Australia pretty quickly going forward. Um, I get asked this question every day of the week, Josh, is now a good time to buy? <laughs> I was going to say yeah. the amount of questions that came in was like, you know, this is all fine, but like, when? Tell me when. <laughs> I think it's the wrong question to ask, Josh, and I'll tell you why. The The, the question should be, is now a good buy, time to buy for me? You know, me. Um, yep. because it's very personalised. You know, I buy properties, whether the market's up, down or sideways. I bought three properties last year. I love to buy properties during downturns, but I'll also buy them during upturns as well. Um, my criteria for buying is, does it make economic sense for me? And does it help me get toward my property goals? Now, and thirdly, and most importantly, you like this one, Ben, can I afford to buy? Do I have a pre-approval? Because that's the golden ticket to actually entering the property market. So many people, you know, think about buying a property don't even bother to talk to a broker and then have a look and then get a bit disillusioned and another year goes by. You know, every year that goes by is an opportunity cost to go into the market. <clears throat> so I say buy when you can afford to buy. That's a pretty simple answer for that. But having said that, um, as I said, you can see here, most people are sitting on the sidelines, low vacancy rates. It is actually a very good time to buy, even though interest rates are higher because there's less competition. So if you can buy, it means you can afford to buy. Um, and it's a great time to get into a market that's going to get rising rental returns and stronger capital growth. So let's unpack that a little bit more. Oh, actually, before we do that, I created this slide here just to talk <laughs> about the emotional 
roller coaster that a lot of people go on, right? When, when you're buying properties, it's not like buying a loaf of bread, is it? Right? Or buying a pair of shoes, right? <laughs> <laughs> when you're buying a property, it's it's probably one of the most important and biggest financial decisions you're going to make in your lifetime, maybe apart from buying a business, you know, um, or the engagement ring for your wife, you know. So, <laughs> so this is what happens. Most people start with a a bit of confidence. They've read a couple of books, been in one or two of these type of webinars, and then they say, yep, yeah, this is great, awesome, I'm going to buy, got their pre-approval, off they go, they buy. And then after they're bought, they start to worry. They look at the headlines, you know, um, war, conflict, invasions, um, interest rates going higher. Um, there's going to be a recession. There's going to be, you know, a major tidal wave of debt coming. And then they get depressed and they need to go and see a psychologist. What am I going to do? And then they realize, actually, I bought a good asset. It's going up in value. I can increase my rent 10%. Oh, gosh, the property price has gone up. It's not the end of the world. Good, I'm confident again, right? So I think we just need to be aware of the emotions that we go through when buying properties, when buying properties, and get independent advice from others that have done it before as well is another question. I was going to say, so, Rich, as a buyer's agent, like, is that a lot of your role? Like, obviously, there's a lot of science and a lot of numbers and you know as you've shown already there's a lot of uh, like a lot that goes into the advice that you give about where and when but is a lot of it just sort of the support because you are abroad basically like it's i'm far away and i i want someone to speak absolutely. to and say hey, good god what have i done absolutely 100 percent. i mean we're, we're not marriage counselors but sometimes when you've got couples <laughs> having very divergent views you have to get them on the yep. same page but it is it is a confidence factor it's a trust factor as well and I, particularly for expats and overseas buyers, when you're not physically inspecting the property, we have to be the eyes and ears and legs on the ground to give our clients the confidence that they're buying a good asset. And we do that. We use WhatsApp. We take videos from all different angles. I mean, a lot of properties you'll see online are Photoshopped and you go and have a look and we stop people from buying bad properties. Like we've had one expat turn up at uh, say, say, I want to buy this property. It looks amazing. We went and inspected it. And this like 10 meter high wall imposing on the backyard, which completely overshadows the yard. It was awful. Or another wow. one, there was like a water tank that was just photoshopped out of the photo. And we said, you'd never buy this property. So <laughs> we stopped people from making, you know, major mistakes that way. Yep. So let's talk about economic headwinds and tailwinds. Um, obviously, the, the negative factors are the higher rates, borrowing capacities down, cost of living with inflation, you know, consumers are, are really feeling it at the moment. We're noticing a lot of retail businesses and other businesses are down from what they're normally at because people don't have as much money. And there's just general share market uncertainty. So they're, they're the headwinds that we've got. But let's look at the things that are underpinning the property market and what's going to help to push the property market going forward over the next 10, 20 years. As I said, number one, migration. That's a huge factor. Um, we cannot underestimate how much and where that's going to happen. And look, most migrants are going to end up in capital cities or major regional towns, not the minor towns. Um, whereas I said, we're not building enough. So there's a limited supply. Australia does have a very adaptable and resilient economy. We are based on services, professionalism. We're not, you know, based on manufacturing and, and mining so much. And yes, that's a big part, but we do have an incredibly resilient economy. Low vacancy rates, um, people's savings in their balance sheets are, were high. They are getting eroded. So we've just got to watch that number carefully to see at what point, as Ben said, there's a lag effect, at what point they're really going to suffer significantly. And if if some people are really on that borderline of can I hold a property, um, that's going to be interesting. I read an article about fiscal cliff fict or faction, and I believe it's more myth than reality. I think people will do everything they can to hold on to their properties rather than sell. Um, so I don't believe there's going to be widespread carnage in the property market unless we see rates go up another, you know, 1% higher than what they are. Um, so look, that's enough on, on the, the tailwinds. And, and as I said, property is a safe haven. It's a great hedge against inflation. It's, and I'm going to show you some numbers in a minute that will sort of blow your socks off. Um, I also get asked, Josh, where are the best opportunities? And look, it's there's opportunities everywhere, but buying investment property is a great opportunity. And I'll talk about where in a minute. If you're an upgrader or a downsizer, there's big opportunities in that market. We're seeing a lot of um, wealthy experts, particularly buy in the eastern suburbs or lower North Shore or like in the premium suburbs of, of Melbourne and Brisbane as well, um, because there's a limited stock of those properties. And in you know, a lot of Asian money is buying that sort of stuff. So 
good opportunities there, good opportunities in commercial development um, and positive cash flow or high yielding type properties as well. So one of the questions we did have was around commercial. So you work with commercial and residential as well. You do both. We do. Correct. Yeah. Yep. We do all types of property, resi, commercial and development sites. We buy it all. Yep. So I'm going to show you two slides now um, because people also ask me another favorite question, Rich, where are property prices going to be in 10 years? Um, so rather than do 10 years, I've done 20 years and 25 years. So, okay, here we go. Here's a drum roll. Here's the price <laughs> of property in Sydney, Melbourne, uh, and all the capital cities in 20, 20 years and 25 years. So what I did, I contacted Tim Lawless, who's the head of CoreLogic Research. I said, Tim, I need the average capital growth rate over the past 25 years and the current median values of each capital city. And then I just used a simple formula compound annual growth rate in an Excel spreadsheet to determine that the value of a property in Sydney is currently 1.35 million. And in 20 years time, it'll be $5 million. And yet if we add another, another five years on top of that, it'll be $7.9 million. And you might go, wow, that's just, that's, that's not right. That's too high. But it's true. Property doubles. If it's a 7% growth rate, it typically doubles every 10 years. Um, and with the compounding, it's amazing what happens. So again, let's go backwards. Sydney's median value back in 2003 was only 475,000, you know. Um, I bought one of my first properties in 1994 and I paid 240,000 for that property. Um, I've sold it, but that property today would be worth 1.8 million had I held it, you know. So it's just a simple compound formula. So I guess the message from these slides is, you know, the longer you stay out of the market, the harder it is to get in because you need a bigger deposit and you're kind of chasing your tail. And the more properties you can buy, the more you can leverage, you know, which Ben talked about recycling your equity to buy more. And that's exactly what I've done to build my portfolio. I bought one property, got a capital growth, refinanced, used that, used that as a deposit for the next one, recycled the equity and off we go. Um, let's also look at apartments as well. So for apartments, we again look at Sydney. Median apartment of uh, uh, in Sydney is eight hundred twenty-two thousand. Uh, if we take it's averaged a five percent growth rate over the last twenty-five years, it'll be worth two point one million dollars in twenty forty-three in twenty years' time. Um, I also think that these numbers on apartments could actually be an underestimate, simply because apartments are probably going to be more affordable for people. So you may see that the, the growth rate, you can see there, if I go back one slide, the growth rate on houses is higher, typically because they've got land content. I've always bought houses more than I have apartments. I've bought both, but I always prefer houses because of the land content. But these figures demonstrate why. But I do think going forward, you'll probably see a slight increase in the average capital growth rate simply based on affordability going forward. All right, so I probably shocked you enough with the numbers. Um, I'll just briefly mention how we operate as a buyer's agent. These are the seven steps that we take all of our clients through. Um, whether you do it with us or on your own, you've got to create a strategy. Um, we help our clients to pinpoint the right locations that fits their budget. So once they've been to see Ben and, and got a finance approval, we know what we're working with. Uh, we provide some background information on the target areas, demographics, median prices, sales volumes, et cetera. And then we start the search process. And, and that's quite an exhaustive um, time frame to do that because you've got to look at everything that's both on market and off market. We have a very um, deep network with real estate agents on the ground. Plus we do our own social media posts to get access to off, off market opportunities direct with vendors. We go and inspect them. Um, once we've found a good one, we evaluate it and we tell our client what it's worth, give them a written re appraisal report on the property. And then we step into due diligence and negotiation phase. So we organize a pest and building inspection or a strata search if it's an apartment, um, check um, all of the neighborhood. And then we step into that negotiation phase. And that's a really important step, having someone between you and the agent when you're negotiating. It just creates that professional buffer so that the agents aren't pulling the wool over your eyes or, or telling you, you know, a bit of a, a bit of a yarn on what it's really worth and making up fictitious offers and all the rest of it. So we know how to play that game really well to get it for the best and lowest price we can. And then we coordinate contract exchange. And then the last step, if you're renting it out, you know, we organize a property manager. And then we also attend to the handover and pre-settlement inspection as well. So, uh, whoops, Daisy, gone too quick. Um, 
So I guess the key benefits, if you are thinking of using a buyer's agent, is that they'll be able to just give you that advice, um, really the, the real strategy, and, and give you that local knowledge, which is really important if you're buying from afar and having that ability to get the, to get the right numbers. Um, we charge a fixed fee. Um, and again, I can email it to anyone. So it's it's on a page with all the numbers on it, but it's a sliding scale under a million dollars. It's the equivalent of 2%. Um, and then when you get up to around $2 million, it's around about 1.5% plus GST. So that's 1.65, including GST. And you pay an engagement fee uh, between three and 5,000 to kickstart the process. And then the balance of the fee on exchange of contracts. So for example, a $600,000 investment property we charge a flat fee of 11,900, including GST, which is also considered a um, an acquisition cost, so it's tax deductible as well. Um, just for the last part, I'm hoping we've got some questions coming, but I'll just give yeah, you a, yeah. a quick snapshot, if I may, just for a few minutes, Josh, on some case studies Please. on what we've bought. Um, I won't go through all of them, I've got a stack of them, but this was actually, you love this, this was from an expat in New York, Josh, that uh, moved back. Go. <laughs> uh, lovely couple. He was a trader, high net worth guy. He had a budget of 15 million, um, but we only spent just over half his budget. We ended up buying this beautiful property uh, in the same street that the Reserve Bank governor lives in uh, for 8.5 million. So yeah, great off market deal. Took 45 days to find it and uh, really stunning property. Um, they're doing, the owners are actually going to do a million dollar renovation on the place. Just out of interest, um, seeing the time yeah. taken, how how far in advance, Rich, do people generally come to you? Like how how long is a normal engagement with someone like yourself? So our agreement runs for six months. Um, okay. So we and typically we buy within about 30 to 60 days of engagement. Yep. It's about one to two months on average. Look, sometimes it might take longer. Um, occasionally you strike it lucky, you just find the perfect property in the first two weeks. Um, but it's just a matter of, it's not a rush. It's just a matter of finding the one that fits their brief and we believe is the right value for them. Yeah, but it's a relatively, like, I guess that's quicker than I potentially would have thought. So in some cases, like it really, you come to you and it's like, let's go. We've got, you know, you've got the yeah. history, you've got the background, you know, the the numbers, it's time to, it's time to buy. I think we've also got, I mean, we've got the network. Like it, it, yes, we're, yeah. we're not a machine, but we have the ability to put our fingers on properties that no one will be able to find themselves. Like yep. our agent database, we've got, you know, over 10,000 agents on our database. We send out text messages, emails to those agents. Say, look, we've got a new client engaged. Here's the brief. What have you got? And we're the yeah. first ones through the property. Um, yeah, like right. for example, if you're trying to buy a property in Sydney's eastern suburbs or in Turak in Melbourne, you're not going to get access to properties properly unless you're using a buyer's agent. That's just that's the bottom line. You won't get access because they just they won't be there. Um, this is one we just bought near Roseville Station. Really, really great property. We saved the client a cool 180 grand um, just simply by negotiating well. Um, another one, the Northern Beaches. I mean, I'm starting with the really high value ones, and I'll get to the other ones in a minute. But this was a cracking location right there on the Mona Vale headland. <laughs> last, it's, it's the last one on the block. Fantastic location. Um, we, we we thought it was worth around six mil, um, but we got it for five point three, um, and they're going to do a quite a significant reno. Really, really great location. Um, another good one we bought down near Cronulla, um, just in the shine near Oyster Bay. Um, lovely couple from Canberra uh, had kept missing out on this property. They'd been looking for two years, and we're just beyond um, frustrated. And um, Nikki and our team just found an awesome deal. Again, saved them a significant sum of money, and they couldn't have been happier. Yeah, they'll be moving just out of interest, when it comes to locations, because I know we had a lot of questions around like where in the country and, and different cities and things, do people normally come to you with a, you know, hey, I really want to invest in Queensland for whatever reason, or is it an equal balance between people with a sort of focus on an idea and some that just say like, look, whatever's going to get me a great return, I'm happy to sort of listen to you. Is there a, is there a mix of those two groups? Absolute mix, Josh. Yeah, look, some people yep. have an idea and I think some people are unfortunately too wedded to buying in their own state because yes. they feel yep. comfortable with that. And I challenge people and say, you really need to be, ag if you're an investor, you need to be agnostic about where you want to buy. It's all about return on the investment. So, you know, again, it comes down to their, we, we do a bit of a deep dive. We ask their income, how many properties they've got, because you've also got to factor in land tax and you want to diversify not um, your, your property holdings across different states to minimise your land tax, but also take opportunity of the growth because the cycle is different. It doesn't happen in everywhere all at once. Um, and also particularly for people perhaps on lower or middle incomes that are cash flow, you know, strapped, 
they want to get a high yield. And so here's a here's a, exactly a case in point with this one. This was a first home buyer, uh, Western Sydney. They wanted to buy a home that had a, an existing granny flat at the rear. And you can see the image there. It's a two-bedroom flat. That was renting for $500 a week. So this lovely couple bought it. Um, they're going to help to pay off the mortgage. Um, we actually got featured on a TV show called The Project a couple of weeks ago um, on this particular purchase. So it was, uh, it was a great one. Yeah. Um, here's a good one. We buy a lot in Brisbane because um, Brisbane's delivering some really good cash flow. Um, this was a really nice house um, in a good middle ring suburb. Um, we bought this for $8.95. And the really interesting thing, we got this offer acceptance at $40,000 below another offer. And that was simply because we had better terms. Our finance, the client was finance approved, ready to go. Whereas the other offer still had to get finance approval and they seemed a bit shaky. So even though someone offered more, they went with our offer because we were a, a dead certainty. And um, yeah, rents for nine, uh, sorry, 1,020 a week. So almost a 6% yield on a house, which is pretty decent. Um, I, yep. Rich, if you don't mind, I might ask, uh, they've got a couple of questions coming in, so I might feed them into it. Ben, okay. if you don't mind, just quickly to recap, because as Rich was saying, you know, investing in multiple properties and making sure that you're uh, leveraging as much as you possibly can. We had a question come in around if you are, you know, using equity, as you mentioned, was a good strategy for people if they're investing in different properties. Uh, one of the questions that came in was around, but if you take, if you're using equity, you're still increasing the loan of, in the example, 240,000 in the old property, plus taking a loan of 800,000 in the new property was the question. Can you just explain how that, that situation works for, for when you were talking about your uh, using equity to purchase? Yeah, from a, like from a financing perspective yeah sure um so that would be two two separate applications so actually this this little example that rich just did um demonstrates uh why getting a pre-approval is actually so strong like um uh, even if you're confident in your your borrowing capacity you should still want to get a pre-approval all right so because when you do put down offers on properties that the sellers are just going to go with certainty over uncertainty right so like if you have the pre-approval from the bank then they're just gonna you know you're, you're more likely to win the thing so in terms of like what you're saying uh, it will be two different applications. You do one application, a loan application for the pre-approval. So up to 80%. So the bank says, hey, we're going to lend you one of $800,000 for a $1 million purchase, right? Go go find a property. But then there'll be also be a second application at the same time that we'll be doing like simultaneously. The, sec the second application is for the refinancing of your existing property. So it will be refinancing, let's say a $500,000 mortgage that you have. Um, but it would also have, uh, you know, the extra 240,000. So the total loan size there is uh, 740,000. But, um, you know, the accountants, they, they, they do love it when you split out the, um, the loan. So that refinance application would be in two loan splits, like account one and account two. Account one would be the 500,000 because you want to separate that. That's 500,000 for that initial property. And then we'll split out uh, account two for 240,000. Um, so we can tell the ATO, the tax office, that that 240000 was used for this upcoming purchase. It just makes um, the accounting just, just easier to follow. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we do like that. So it'd be two separate applications. Yeah. Understood. With, with loan accounts. Yeah, got it. And Rich, I know you were just saying about, uh, you know, you've got to be a little bit agnostic about where the locations that you're looking at. We did have a question come in around uh, purchasing a place, in this case, in Melbourne, St Kilda, uh, so St Melbourne, St Kilda Road area, to use as a place while well, visiting relatives a few times a year. So this is a not an investment. I assume you, you obviously work with people that are going down the investment path, but also the ones that are looking to, you know, as you've got there like home buyers and people that are looking to live in the places and temporarily is that something that you'd advise like what what kind of strategies are around a, a place to temporarily when you're back in Australia visiting family and friends yeah I guess um you've got to be careful not to mix too many um, metaphors or too many objectives all at once sure. <laughs> um in some ways because if you're going to buy an investment property if you want to get a long-term tenant um, that's great. You've locked them in. But if you're looking to use the place yourself, you're going to have to do it on a short-term let or do it as an Airbnb. Um, now, there's various restrictions. Now, in Melbourne, for example, the stupid government has just brought in this massive additional 7% tax on Airbnb properties in Victoria. So I would suggest it's not a very viable strategy. You're probably better off to just simply buy an investment property, have it rented out long-term, and then just rent your own place out as an Airbnb, like rent another property for the time that you're here in Australia. Um, and that way you've, you're not affecting the, the long-term tenancy. 
uh, and then paying a huge you know, tax for, for the privilege of it. Um, but again, we can talk through with that person very individually yeah. and run the numbers on, on that individually. Mm. No, for sure. And Ben, Rich was just touching on, and I know we talked about the fact that uh, we weren't going to go into too much detail about tax, but just from a, we, we did have a couple of people that are obviously in the earlier stages of thinking about investing and, and they were sort of looking for the 30,000 foot view of, you know, investing in real estate, what are the tax implications? Is it just sort of a... Uh, and I, I'm aware of the time, so I don't want to go into too much depth, but are there are a few sort of things that people should be starting to do some research in before so that they can educate themselves? Yeah, yeah. So, because um, right now, I think a lot of uh, expats in the US or just globally, that you, you, you guys are all non-tax residents of Australia, right? Um, so, um, and so you don't need to lodge a tax return uh, in Australia. But as soon as right. you're earning any Australian sourced income, you're going to need to lodge a tax return. So that usually comes with your first investment property, your second investment property in Australia. You need to lodge a tax return for that. You, you know, you, uh, you'll you be eligible for the 100% of the negative gearing benefits. So there's no change for, for being overseas. You, you're going to get exactly the same privileges as if you were living in Australia. You'll be able to get all the tax um, uh, tax deductions uh, with mortgage interest being the largest tax deduction that you'll be able to get. And a lot of our clients are negatively geared. I guess because it doesn't take too long, too much to get negatively geared at, at uh, the current interest rates that we're at. So if you're borrowing something like 50, 60% loan to value ratio, you know, you're pretty much already negatively geared, which means you don't need to pay any income tax in Australia because the income tax starts at 32.5 cents per dollar straight off the bat. There's no threshold like you would get if you were, um, you know, back uh, li living in Australia. So some other things, I think that the, I'll, I'll just touch on the, the, the most thing that I think that you need to be aware of, which is the nationality. I think because... Expats do tend to uh, marry uh, non-Australians, <laughs> like when they go overseas, right? Like from from myself, I'm guilty. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah me, me, me as well. So, and you know, you're trying to buy a property back home. You think, okay, I'm gonna buy it with my wife, right? Um, but she's not an Australian citizen. There are some massive stamp duty implications. Okay. Okay. Uh, if you do that. So, because there's a foreign buyer stamp duty, even if you're married. Um, so, so um, where where the the state revenue office would charge an extra eight percent on the stamp duty, um, for the foreign buyer. So you the, the the way to do it is just to buy in the Australian citizen's name. Um, but you can still have your wife on the mortgage application, uh, to service the loan. Like if you need her income to help you service that loan for that massive, you know, four or five million dollar <laughs> property, then you're gonna need her income. Yeah, you can still have her on as a co-borrower, um, but you just put yourself on the title, but then, you know, you discuss amongst yourself that, but yeah, usually it's fine. So, you know, there's some ways uh, around to doing that. Yeah. So I think I'll leave it at that. Yeah, no, perfect. I, I think sort of to, to wrap things up, um, Rich, in terms of preparing for, you know, let's say I'm someone that started down this path and I'm starting to think about like I want to invest or I want to get a property and I'm, I'm really at the earlier stages or if I'm a little bit further along and I know I need a property at a certain time, are there some things people can start to do to prepare, like to get the sort of the research happening? Do they reach out to you early and start to have a chat or is yeah. it, you know, they really think, need to go to Ben first or? I think just, well, they can do both. I think reach out to us just for an initial strategy chat and then the yep. best thing they can do is get their tax affairs, their finance documents and get them over to Ben straight away. Because once, I mean, we work with Ben really well. We'll send referrals. He sends us referrals. And, you know, we just, no money changes hand. We just want to help each other's businesses. And at the end of the day, yeah. we want, we're all about helping the client get the best outcome. And and we have a chat. I think people go too far down the rabbit hole of looking for a property they think will work before they got the finance approval or before they've thought through their strategy. So I think have a chat to us. We can just talk generally about this, what, what might work for this situation. Um, and then get your documents over to Ben. He can do a pre-approval and then you're ready to engage us and we go from there. Yeah, awesome. And Ben, from your side, you know, it, it's basically that, just prepare as much as you possibly can. And uh, obviously you guys do mortgage and tax, so it can be sort of come to you hat in hand and say, sort me out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, uh, yeah, during our, our strategy call, um, it may be something whereby I have to send you back to do some homework with restructuring your family. <laughs> Uh, for about three months before you know we're ready to go because like i said limited lending options you don't want to submit an application if it's not going to get approved because then the bank will have your documents on file for two years um and then uh, it could be a case where i can't go back to that bank like you went to that bank initially like that bank was the best bank for you but yes, now i can't but go you've back misrepresented 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, so yeah, I won't submit applications if it's not going to get approved. Um, so if it's not going to get approved, I'll, I'll just tell you, hey, there's some things you need to, you know, tidy up first. And then and then we'll, we'll go in three months time. Yeah, cool. So there's no harm in going to, to both of you early and sort of starting the conversation. But there is potentially harm in saying like, I'm going to just try and wing it and send in some applications to see what can happen, because that can have a negative effect for up to two years, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. 50 different banks, you scrub with five banks, who cares? There's 35 other ones, you, you don't have that luxury. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, okay. So uh, I, I know that Rich, you've got a, a lot of other great examples of case studies um, that people so you are going to share the document that you were presenting to. So there's plenty of information that's coming out. And I know mm -hmm. that Ben also has a document that they're going to circulate after this. So um, I want to thank Rich and Ben very much, Rich Harvey, CEO at Property Buyer and Ben Wong, co-founder and principal mortgage broker at Odin Mortgage and Tax. Thank you very much, guys. This has been, obviously, there's a lot of numbers, a lot of depth, um, but I think a lot of people will have really like gotten down a path where they can now know the questions they have to ask and will hopefully reach out. To all of you watching, thank you for joining us. We do have a survey that will come out after this to so you can give a bit of feedback. You can tell us what you thought. Um, but also it can give you the opportunity to connect with Rich and Ben. So we've got, uh, we've, we've already asked, you know, if you'd like to receive the materials and we'll make sure that you've got access to those. Um, we'll send that through in the next few hours and tomorrow. But uh, I want to thank you both again very much and thank everyone for, uh, for tuning in. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Josh. Great to be with you. Thanks, guys. Good night. Thanks.